Well, we welcome all of you who are joining us online, as well as those of you who are meeting here at Central Campus, along with others who are meeting at one of our other campuses in Bearspaw, in, in uh, Airdrie, Bridgeland, and also South Calgary. You know, occasionally I enjoy reading trivia and, um, and, and sharing trivia, and when our boys were young, I, I shared some trivia with them from time to time, and one time I said, sons, are you aware that the first man in powered flight was from Ohio? And they indicated that they weren't aware of that. And I said, did you know that the first man to orbit the earth in space was from Ohio? Well, they weren't aware of that either. I said, did you know that the first man on the moon was from Ohio? I mean, what do you think about that? And one of them said, sounds to me like a lot of people are wanting to get out of Ohio. <laughs> now you've, you're probably wondering what this has to do with our study in Romans. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> but I'm just trying to lighten things up a little bit, you see, because before we get into our study today, uh, you know, Romans is a very rich theological book. It's foundational to our faith. But it can be challenging to understand. And it's going to require us to focus and to pay attention. And so join with me uh, and open your Bibles or your Bible apps to Romans chapter 8. In which the Apostle Paul instructs us in what it means to live in the Spirit or to live in Christ. And remember from last time those two phrases can be used interchangeably. Now many Christians continue to live as slaves to sin and to the law because they're not aware or do not believe perhaps or don't understand who they are in Christ. Many Christians believe that God is off somewhere in the distance and he's kind of grading their performance. And he kind of pats them on the back when they do good and he punts them into the doghouse when they don't. And since they struggle daily living victoriously over sin, they, they constantly feel like they're disappointing God, which really tempts them over time to just give up. And sadly, some do. But here's the thing. Freedom from the power of sin and this struggle that we've been talking about isn't found in following a certain pathway or following a certain program. It isn't found in keeping a list of rules. It isn't found in embracing a system of, of beliefs or just trying harder. No, it is found in a person, Jesus Christ. Through our study in Romans so far, we've learned when you embrace Christ as your Lord and Savior, two things take place simultaneously. First, you receive a new identity in Christ. When you put your trust in him, in the eternal realm, you are now in Christ and Christ is in you. And therefore, God sees you as forgiven, as righteous and perfect. Again, not because you live perfectly in this life or in the earthly realm, but because in the eternal realm, you are one with Christ and Christ is perfect. That's the first thing you receive when you put your faith in Jesus, a new identity in Christ. The second thing you receive is Jesus enters your life. He invade your spirit as it were making you spiritually alive and as you trust him and as you yield your life to his control he will live his life his life the Christian life he will live the Christian life through you and you will receive power to not only live a satisfying fulfilling and God pleasing life but also to increasingly say no to the temptation to sin. It's called living in Christ or living in the Spirit. And that's the focus of Roman 8, 
Romans 8, what it means to live in the Spirit. Now, in the first 17 verses of Romans 8, we're introduced to three key principles to living in the Spirit. And if you missed it, I encourage you to go to our website, look under sermons, and take in the last couple of sermons on Romans 8. Today, as we study verses 18 to 28, we're introduced to a fourth principle, which is this. Living in the Spirit means I am convinced God will use all things that I surrender to Him to accomplish His good purposes in my life. This truth is captured best in verse 28. Please join me in reading it. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, I'm wondering if you've ever gone through a difficult time and someone came along and said something like, hang in there, buddy. It'll all work out in the end. And what that person usually means by that is, a happy ending is coming. I mean, how many times did you hear someone say during COVID that life will eventually get back to normal? For most Canadians, happiness is defined as being healthy, living a long, meaningful life, being married, having a family, having genuine, lifelong friends, a good job and income, a car, a nice house with a white picket fence. And most Canadians will get some upset if their life doesn't include all or most of those things. But the truth is, things don't always turn out that way. Jeremiah, he was called by God to a special mission. And yet many years later, we find him in a cistern up to his knees in mud. And all he had to show for his devotion to the call of God on his life were scars and bruises from being attacked and beaten and imprisoned by those who despised him and the message that God asked him to preach. And here's the really alarming part. Not one person responded favorably to Jeremiah's message and warnings. From what we can ascertain from the scriptures, after 40 years of faithful ministry to the call of God, not one life was changed as a result of Jeremiah's ministry. Now, I would find that really hard as a pastor if that was my story. But that was Jeremiah's story, and it's in the Bible for a reason, folks. To remind us that life does not always go the way we think it should. Now, in the book of Lamentations, the book of Lament, we see that Jeremiah, he, he worked through his disappointment. And he was faithful to God right up to the very end. But the reality is, things do not always work out the way we assume they will. And that message isn't very popular today in our culture, is it? I've known people who struggle with pain most of their lives. There are and there have been millions of people in our world who for all or most of their life went to sleep hungry most nights without proper shelter or clothes. There are and there have been millions of people in our world who most of their lives, if not all of their lives, lived with the ravages of war and ethnic and racial hatred every day, never knowing what it means to walk down the street without fear. You see, for all kinds of people, things do not always go as 
planned and hoped for. And the Apostle Paul touches on why that is. He says, our world is broken. I invite you to stand with me and just read a portion of the scripture text beginning in verse 19. For the creation waits an eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. You may be seated. Now this passage teaches that all creation groans because something is wrong. Things are not the way God intended them to be from the beginning. See, when God first made the world, it was perfect. There was no evil, there was no pain, there was no death, no hunger, no hatred, no war or natural disasters. None of that. God said that his creation was good, and it was good. But now, says Paul in verse 22, all of creation is groaning. It's groaning because in Genesis 3, our first parents, Adam and Eve, rebelled against God and went their own way. And what God warned them would happen if they disobeyed and rebelled against him did in fact take place. Death and evil entered the cosmos, and life on the planet has been decaying and breaking down ever since. But let's not be too hard on Adam and Eve, because each one of us have essentially made the same decision they did. Isaiah 53, 6 just puts it out there, matter-of-factly. It says, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And because our first parents chose that path, not only do we live in the slavery and the destruction, the destructive power of sin, but all of creation has been subjected to the curse and the bondage stemming from that. Romans 8.21 says, creation itself is in bondage to decay, which is a really good description of the second law of thermodynamics, which says that everything is disintegrating. Everything is falling apart. Everything moves from order to disorder. Because of our rebellion against God, we are now battling nature. Weeds now grow along with beautiful flowers. We have tornadoes, we have floods, hurricanes, and earthquakes. We have animals preying on one another. The earth is broken. And Paul says it's groaning, it is waiting for the redemption of the Son of God, for the day when he will come again and make all wrongs right. And the imagery that Paul uses here to describe that uh, anticipation of his coming is people who sit on the edge of their seat or stand on tiptoe waiting to see who wins. That is a picture of the high expectation there is for the coming of Christ. Another picture used in verse 22 is a woman enduring childbirth. Erwin Lutzer, he recalls being with his wife when she was in labor and in the room next door, they could hear another woman who was obviously in labor, and she was screaming over and over again, please, somebody kill me. Please just kill me. <clears throat> now, each time my wife Gwen gave birth to one of our sons, fortunately, she didn't scream, and fortunately, she didn't make such a horrible request. But I do recall her giving me 
that look. <laughs> that left me with the distinct impression she wanted to hurt me like she was hurting. Unless you think otherwise, I just want you to know that I was hurting too. I mean, I was exhausted. I was identifying with Gwen's travail so much that I got a headache. I literally had to lie down in the bed next to her. <laughs> Definitely not getting a lot of empathy from the rest of you. But here's the thing, as hard and as painful as it was for Gwen, she would be the first to say the hope, the anticipation of the birth of our son made all the pain, all the hardship bearable and worthwhile. And so it is with the coming of Jesus. All of creation groans, but there is a very real hope and anticipation that Jesus is returning and will make everything right again. And that not only we, but creation itself will become everything that God intended it to be originally. But not only is creation groaning, we ourselves are groaning, eagerly awaiting for the redemption of our body. Look at verse 23. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Now, the term first fruits refers to the start of the harvest, and that the full and that the complete harvest is yet to come. And so when Paul refers here to the first fruits of the Spirit, this is what he's essentially saying. When you put your faith in Christ, the Spirit entered your life and began to transform you into the image of Jesus Christ. However, the best is yet to come. I mean, the joy, the love, the peace and the power of the Holy Spirit that you're experiencing right now, just remember, that's just a foretaste of what's to come. Just the beginning of all that God has for us. Now we sense and experience the Spirit in part, then we will know and experience the Father, Son, and Spirit fully. One writer said, you know, it's like you're climbing a mountain. And you know that the view is spectacular, but right now you're, you're making your way through the brush and the trees. You're fighting your way through all of that. You don't see much of anything. But eventually, you clear the tree line. And when you get up to the top of the mountain, the view takes your breath away. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul elaborates on this. He writes, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. The Bible teaches that a day is coming when our present bodies, which you know, are made to live in the earthly realm will be miraculously exchanged for a heavenly body made for an eternal existence. Paul writes, if our present body is like a tent, our heavenly, if our present body is like a tent, our heavenly body will be like a building or a house. Our heavenly body won't wear out. It won't die. We won't grow tired or experience pain. We won't put on weight. I mean, that in itself sounds like heaven, amen? Yes. And there will be no longer be any need for dentures and hearing aids and glasses and walkers and wheelchairs and all the other daily aids for living. 
But until that time, we live in mortal bodies that are subject to disease, fatigue, illness, and yes, aging. Until that time, we live in a world where we can be victimized by the evil and cruelty of others. Until that time, we will suffer a number of hardships and difficulties. Now, people ask me, is there healing in the atonement of Christ? In other words, did Jesus die only for our spirit? Or did he also die for our body and soul? Well, the answer is, of course, Jesus died for our body, soul, and spirit. Paul prays in 1 Thessalonians 5, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is incomprehensible that Jesus would die for only part of us. But here's the thing. The Bible also teaches clearly there's a not yet aspect to the redemption and the healing of our bodies. Yes, God does intervene and heal today. And it is important that we pray for healing because God calls us to do so. But as Paul teaches here in these verses, our bodies are not redeemed in this life. If they were redeemed, our bodies wouldn't decay, they wouldn't age, they wouldn't die, or for that matter, they wouldn't need to be healed. Look at verse 23 again. Paul writes, we groan inwardly, as we wait eagerly for what? Well, two things. First, the fulfillment, the complete fulfillment of our adoption to sonship. And secondly, Paul says we wait eagerly for what? The redemption of our bodies. In every area of our lives, there is a now and a not yet aspect to our redemption. For example, we still experience the struggles of sin. Even though Jesus Christ died that we might be set free from the power of sin, we might be able to say no to sin. A day is coming when we will sin no more. We still experience the ravages of pain and deterioration in our bodies. Even the the day is coming when we'll be given new bodies made for an eternal existence and no longer subject to the hurt and the pain that we see today. But until that day comes, Paul says, we groan. We groan when we suffer the effects of aging. Now, I can't believe that 30 years have gone by, 40 years have gone by since I became pastor of this church. It just seems like that. And I think of the things I was able to do physically and so forth that I'm not able to do anymore. At least, not the way I used to do them. I mean, don't you at times, you know, just look at a sports personality like Wayne Gretzky and you recognize if he was out there playing right now, he would stand out, but not in a good way. That's what aging does, folks. It's a reality for all of us. And we groan about that. We groan because of how sin hurts or even destroys aspects of our lives or how it hurts and destroys aspects of other people's lives that we love. We groan when we see people waste their lives and miss God's best for them. Don't we? Now verse 24 reinforces reinforces this truth. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? 
But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Now this passage says we are saved in hope. Notice it doesn't say not by hope, but we are saved in hope. In other words, we are saved by faith. We're not saved by hope. Hope doesn't save anybody. So what Paul writes here, what he's saying is we are saved in hope. He's saying we are saved with the hope. That even though we do not yet have everything that Jesus promised, one day we will. A day is coming when the lamb and the wolf will lie down together. A day is coming when the desert will bloom like a rose. A day is coming when we will have bodies suited for an eternal existence that will not age or wear out or hurt. And in verse 25, Paul says, that is our hope as Christians. That is what we wait for patiently. And so creation groans. We also groan. And that's why we read in verse 26, the Spirit also groans. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Now this passage teaches that in those moments when we don't even know how to pray anymore or perhaps just out of sheer exhaustion we just can't find the strength or the words to pray that the Spirit himself intercedes for us. Now I can tell you from my own experience that when you're in the valley of the shadow of death there comes a point when you've prayed all that you can pray. There comes this point when you've said all that you can say. And what a comfort it is to know that not only other believers are praying for you, but as Paul says here, the Spirit intercedes for God's people. Now notice it says the Spirit intercedes for us in accordance with the will of God. Have you ever wondered what that is really saying? What it's really saying is, is that if you or I are praying outside of the will of God, if we're praying with wrong motives, which remember James warns us about, verse 27 says, the Spirit prays the right prayers according to the will of God, which means the Spirit prays the way we should pray. Now think about the implications of that. If the Spirit prays according to God's will and prays the way we should pray on our behalf, that means what the Spirit prays for us is what will happen. God the Spirit prays according to the will of God and God the Father in His sovereignty answers by allowing experiences into our lives that we need may not want but we need which may include blessings and miracles but it may also include trials testing and hardships so make no mistake things do not always work out the way we want not even for Christians but even though things do not always work out, in verse 28, Paul writes, God works all things out for our good. Notice it does not say all things are good. I mean, there are a lot of bad things on this planet and a lot of things that happen to us that are not good and should not be celebrated. Neither does it say that all things work out the way I might want them to. What it does say is, and we know. Not, and we hope. Not, and we wish. No. It says, and we know certain things. And what we know is 
that God loves us, that he is a good and trustworthy God, and therefore I can have an unshakable confidence that whatever I surrender to him, be it good, be it bad, be it even ugly, he will use it all to accomplish his good purposes in my life. Now people ask me, well, what about sins that I personally commit? What about times that I've really messed up my life? Does God also use them for my ultimate good? Well, the answer to that is a qualified one. Because I want to be very clear that the sins that I commit and the sins that you commit always have consequences. Always have consequences. And so we must not take sin lightly. But even though we reap what we sow in this life, if we humble ourselves, if we confess our sins, if we own up to our sins and we learn from them and we turn our heart toward God, not away from Him, God will use even our failures, all of our regrets to accomplish His good purpose in our lives. Man, do I celebrate when that happens in someone's life. And we must also. You know, someone said it's like baking a cake. You use butter, you use flour, oil, sugar, eggs. Consume any of those items individually, and you're probably going to choke. Like, how would you like to just have a big chunk of butter? Not on your bread, I'm talking a big chunk. Or a mouthful of flour. Or drink a cup of olive oil. Not too tasty. But together, amazingly, all those ingredients can create something good, even delicious. Unless, of course, you bake like I do. (laughs) Now, let me just say, if, if you do not believe in God... If, if you take him out of the equation of your life, then you cannot attribute any purpose to your suffering other than the fact that luck has not gone your way. Make no mistake, you can't have it both ways. You can't blame God for the tough times in your life if you don't believe he exists. I mean, that's like believing that dogs don't exist and yet trying to blame a dog for biting you. It is absolutely illogical, makes no sense whatsoever. On the other hand, if you believe in God, then you need to believe what the Bible says about him. And that is he will use all things to accomplish his good purpose in your life. So what is his good purpose for your life and my life? It is to transform you and me into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Look at verse 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. Now don't let all those big words, those big theological words in verse 29, like foreknew and predestined, cause you to miss the main point of that verse. The good purpose that God wants to perform in your life and my life is that we would be a reflection of his son, Jesus Christ. That's it, period. Jesus is the prototype. He's the first fruit of what we will become if we daily live in humble dependence upon his enabling grace. You know, back in Romans 5, 3, Paul makes an alarming statement. He says, we can rejoice in our suffering. And we think, are you serious, Paul? I mean, how can you say that? 
Well, let me give you a few reasons that we see in scriptures. First of all, Paul says so in Romans 5, 3. We can rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Which is what? It's the confidence that God is using this period of hardship, this time of suffering, to produce the image of Christ in us right now. To make us more loving, to make us more generous, to make us more kind, to make us more gentle, to make us more wise, more patient, more faithful and joyful. In short, to make us more like Christ. And furthermore, as Christians, we can rejoice during the tough times because we know from the life of Job that God is in control and there is nothing that comes our way that he isn't aware of or that he doesn't allow. And thirdly, we can rejoice during difficult times because we know that even when he allows hardships to come our way, His motive is good. His motive is love, not anger. And therefore, he's got our best interests at heart, correcting us or pruning us for greater growth in order to be conformed into the likeness of Jesus and also so that we might be even more effective in his kingdom. You know, Joseph learned this truth. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. He lost over 13 years of his life, his youth, basically. As best we can tell, it was probably the last three years of his teen years and all of his 20s that he lost. And he had every reason to be some upset with his brothers. And yet when he had the power to seek revenge and to make them pay, He chose to rest in God's sovereignty and to keep God's perspective in mind. He said, you, he is speaking to his brothers. He said, you meant this for evil. But God meant it for good. God allowed it for good. Did you catch that? God meant it for good. God can take even the injustices that are done to us and accomplish his good purposes if we will surrender it to him. Now, on the other hand, if we want our pound of flesh, if we continue to nurse our bitterness and our anger toward God or toward other people that have hurt us in some way, we are not living in the spirit, folks, and we're going to miss God's best for us. Friend, God wants to use all things in your life and mine to accomplish his good purposes, but it won't happen unless we surrender our lives completely to him. So what does it mean to surrender all to Christ? Surrendering to Christ means giving him your desire, which some people would say is their right It is surrendering your desire or your right to be happy. It's it's giving him your desire or right to be noticed. It's giving him your desire or right for life to be fair. It's giving him your desire to be appreciated. It's giving him your desire to get your own way. It's giving him your desire to do what you feel like doing. It's giving him your desire to get even. It's giving him your desire to nurse your hurt and anger. Now, the reason this must be so is because you can't hold on to these and you can't walk in the Spirit and maintain a thankful spirit at the same time. See, Christ gave up these desires when he came to earth and died on the cross for you and me. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 tells us to give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you. In Christ Jesus. Those who live in Christ, those who walk in the Spirit, do not give thanks for all circumstances. No, they give thanks in all circumstances. Now, why would God 
ask us to give thanks in all circumstances. Because when we give thanks, we are making a faith statement that we believe our lives are in God's hands and that we have a deep-seated confidence That God is working out all things for our good even when nothing seems to make sense at the present time. You know, years ago I I heard a story that reminded me of a, a little game that I used to play with each of our boys when they were young. It was a game where I would throw them in the air and then I would catch them just before they hit the ground. In every case, he was relaxed. He was having a wonderful time. In fact, he'd cry out, do it again, Dad, do it again. And often I remember marveling at his simple faith and trust and thinking, man, if I was in his place, you know, I'd be freaking out and I'd be stiff as a board. But you see, the reason he was so relaxed even when his little world was totally out of control in that moment, is because he was completely confident in me. See, we had a history together. We played this game before, and I only dropped him once. <laughs> Not true, I never did, but, but here's my point. Some of you may feel as if you're free falling out of control without a parachute. Some of you are up in the air and you're not exactly sure what's happening or why it's happening and you just have no idea of how things are going to end up. Some of you have suffered loss. You're having trouble finding your way forward. And all I can say to you is this. Even though life at times will not make any sense. And even though at times life will cause you to question God's love and cause you to question that God actually has your best interests at heart. Lean into him, friend. Relax in the sovereign character of God. Believe to the core of your being that he is good that he is faithful, that he is totally trustworthy, and that he is for you. He is not against you. He is for you. Rest in him knowing that the God who has never dropped you in the past won't drop you now. That the God who was faithful then will be faithful now. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Just take a moment now and and ask the Lord, Lord, what are you saying to me through this message from your word? What are you calling me to do about it, Lord? What lies do I have to renounce? What promises do I need to embrace? 